How you doing? Welcome to First Look. I feel like I, uh, I haven't done this in a while, but it's only because last week I recorded um, like ahead of time so that I had it, uh, you know, queued up for you whenever, whenever I was gone. Uh, but in actuality, uh, we haven't skipped a beat, which is, which is good. Um, so this week I'm outside again and uh, boy, I gotta tell you, if it gets nicer in October in Western Pennsylvania, it, not by much. Uh, it is the perfect temperature. It's sunny and it is, uh, the leaves are like, the leaves are leaving. I mean, they're, they're doing their thing. They're, uh, it's, it's pretty great. Uh, so I'm glad to be here with you today as I kind of roam around the edge of Frick Park. Another park though. I had to, I had to go somewhere else. I don't know even where I'm going to go. We'll figure it out as we go. Anyway, so this week, um, this is kind of a week of, uh, a little bit of a week of discernment in a couple of different ways. Um, the first way that it's a week of discernment is that um, uh, we just had um, Stewardship Sunday. And Stewardship Sunday is a time for the congregation to kind of think about who we are, where our commitments are, where we want to go, what we can do, how we can do that together. That's the kind of thing that we think about a lot uh, during this week. And it's also, in addition to that, uh, we just had a kind of a town hall um, information gathering kind of thing. And uh, I want to thank all who made that happen and who participated. Uh, and so we're, we're gathering the information that you wrote down with the questions that we had and are looking to figure out what they mean and what we do with them. And so basically the idea is, is that we, um, we take that information and um, we apply it to um, how the session, how the leadership is going to um, discern the spiritual plan, how we're going to look at um, just, you know, all sorts of kind of elements of um, where we want to go and, and how we want to enact and um, live out the things that we have um, been committed to, to looking at over the last couple of years. So, um, that's part of this discernment. And so what we'll be doing on Sunday is we'll have, um, we'll have Pledge Sunday. And that's a time for us to bless um, what you all have told us that how you're able to and want to participate from a financial standpoint in uh, what we're doing here together. Um, and so... I thank you ahead of time for that discernment, for that thoughtfulness. Um, I know it takes um, uh, a lot of planning and commitment and all sorts of things. Um, and so I'm, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for your willingness to do that. I'm just kind of wondering. I don't know where I want to go yet. So um, as we do that, um, part of that us identifying who we are and thinking about that, that element of things is also um, Pledge Sunday is also uh, Reformation Sunday. And uh, sometimes we've done that with bagpipes. and um, uh, But this, this year we still have, we have banners and we have, um, You know, we have the, uh, ouch. <laughs> I got kind of caught there, uh, a little uh, off kilter. Anyway, the banners are up and we've been talking a lot about identity. And we've been kind of discussing what that means for us um, as, a, as Northmont. But it's good for us to be able to sort of step back also and consider who are we and 
as Presbyterians? You know, what does it mean for us to, to uh, be a part of that tradition? And part of the Sunday, as we're looking at who we are, we're saying who we are, we're announcing who we are, we're pledging who we are and who we're going to be, is to remember where we've come from. And so Reformation Sunday is a part of that. And the Reformation goes back 500 years. And it's a part of several Reformations, which I won't bore you with. But uh, the 16th century saw um, a pretty big shakeup in the Western church in Europe. Um, you know, a lot of people know Martin Luther, and they knew the 95, 95 Theses, and they know who John Calvin is, or at least you've heard the name, and um, Zwingli, and other folks who um, were crucial in the reformations that took place um, throughout Western Europe when it came to um, creating what we now understand to be the Protestant Church that is different than the Catholic Church. And from there, you spring um, certain areas of thought, I guess, uh, um, basic theological kind of tracks. So you have, um, you have what it means to be uh, more reformed, and there's plenty of things you can read about that. Um, so uh, like Lutheran, to be Lutheran, or to be Presbyterian, or to be um, United Church of Christ. Um, those are all Reformed um, denominations. And then there's other groups that are that, that would take some more explanation, like um, Church of England, Episcopal, Methodism is kind of on a parallel track, but not the same. And you know, the Baptist Church kind of took its own, um, you know, direction and some of that has to do with communion and some of that has to do with baptism and some of that has to do with um, the nature of salvation. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's a big history lesson and it's a big theological lesson. But, um, you know, we, we look at that history. And there are probably a, lo a lot of spots there that you could consider extraordinarily important. Um, sometimes we talk about what's essential to the tenets that we hold on to. Um, and you've heard me talk about often the idea of um, that everything that we do um, in Reformed thought or in uh, a Presbyterian theology is really focused on the idea that God initiates everything, that God is the author and we are the responders. Um, so we don't, we can't, save ourselves um, and so our theology of salvation reflects that um, our we can't claim faith um, just on our own you know that we are inspired by and led by the holy spirit to have faith and so that is shows up in our theology so um, there are a lot of elements like that that um, you know things that we do that maybe we don't even always know why we do them, um, but they're a big part of who we are. And I think it's okay that we take them for granted because that means that they're really deeply rooted and things that we can feel secure in. And so that's sort of the context of the pat or of the Sunday. You know, we're thinking about who we are, we're thinking about who we've been, we're thinking about our history, thinking about our future. And so for me, um, as I looked at the passage that was, a, was on the, uh, in the lectionary for this week, it's a, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty great passage to match with those things because it's foundational. Um, this, is a, this is Matthew 22, and it's verses 34 through 46. And unfortunately, um, because I left the house without my little piece of paper 
and I can't look it up on my phone because I'm talking to you on my phone, I'm going to have to paraphrase the passage for you. But uh, I have every faith that you can pause or you can um, just follow along as you'd like and that, um, and that you can get the gist of what I'm saying. So, um, Matthew 22, 34 through 46, basically says this. Um, this is the greatest commandments passages. Hold on one second. My watch wants me to do something, and I'm going to listen to it. All right. So the passage says this. It says basically uh, that Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees which are kind of like um, the leaders of different denominations, right? They would have, the Sadducees would have um, one understanding of theology and of history and of eschatology, which is like study of what happens in the end times, you know, at, at the afterlife, that kind of thing. Um, eschatology, eschaton means end times, study of, eschatology. Okay. So the Sadducees would have one version of that. And the Pharisees would have another version of that. And so it's getting kind of worked out by um, these groups that are there and sort of interviewing Jesus. And um, nature is attacking and, uh, and so they're sort of questioning Jesus. So they ask him a big question. And the question is, um, what's the greatest commandment? Now, that's, that's ridiculous to kind of ask a person. Um, because the Torah is long. There is many laws. There's over 600 laws in the Torah. And... Um, they're asking, which one of these is the most important? And so, they're thinking, of course, that Jesus is going to stumble over something or whatever. And so, of course, Jesus answers confidently and um, right to the point. And so, he says, the greatest commandments are to love the Lord with all your heart and all your strength and all your mind. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And so that's, you know, what are you going to argue with there? Love God and love people. And that loving God helps us to love people. And so they're just sort of, you know, stand there like well not much we can do about that because of course that lays the groundwork for anything and everything that he would say after that you know um, <clears throat> anything and everything they can't argue it against it um, but they also it kind of holds them accountable to um, what are they doing what is their theology telling them what did they think he was going to say love God and love people which is something that everyone can do regardless of what track they're on you, or do you follow the Sadducee line do you follow the Pharisee line something else doesn't matter love God and love people <clears throat> and then it gets a little tricky um, because they ask him or Jesus kind of flips and says, okay, well, now I got a question for you, uh, which I'm sure they were not excited about. So he says something to the effect of, um, we talk about being of the line of David. And he asked them, you know, who is the Messiah? And they basically answer, well, uh, the Messiah will be uh, the son of David. And he says, okay, well, then why is it that in Scripture we see God 
talking about the fact that, um, again, I'm paraphrasing, that the Messiah will be the Lord of David. How can be the Messiah be the Lord of David and also be the son of David at the same time? And it goes on to say, not only did they not have an answer, but they didn't ask him any more questions. And I like that. I've never given an answer to anybody where they just decided that's such a good answer that we're never going to ask you another question. That doesn't happen for pastors very often. But there's a reason that we're not Jesus. Anyway, so... Um, so where does that lead us? What does that make us think about? Well, obviously that answer says a lot about Jesus. You know, he's trying to, um, sort of put the, the experts in the law in a corner and make them answer something that they don't want to answer. The fact that they can answer obviously um, supports, I guess you could say, the idea that Jesus' disciples would have would have adhered to, which is that Jesus is the Messiah. Which is interesting, of course, because not only is Jesus God, you know, Son of God but also um, is in the line of David. And so he's not so much refuting what they think as much as expanding upon it. He's sort of giving them a um, something to think about. He's sort of laying the groundwork for where the... Messiah theology, which we would call Christology, where, where that's going to be headed, how it's going to change the way that people saw themselves and saw the world, um, that's what's going to happen. That's where he's taking them. Now, I don't think that's what these experts thought he was doing. He thought he was just trying to shut them down. So they'd, you know, lay off. But in reality, he's laying the groundwork for 2,000 years worth of study about the nature of God, the nature of salvation, and the identity of Christ. Which is obviously, you know, pretty important. And he does all of that with that one question. And so, part of what I think this passage gets at is a couple of really important um, foundational uh, concepts. First, that everything that we have learned, everything that we know about who, we, who God is, who we are and what we are supposed to do in response to everything we know and read has to lead us towards those commandments. If your theology, if your politics, if the way you relate to your community or to your family doesn't can't be supported by I'm doing this out of love of God and love of neighbor because you can't divorce the two if this doesn't help me be more devoted to God while also being more devoted to my neighbor then that point whether it's theological spiritual political, social, if it doesn't, if you can't support it through, that, through those commandments, then it might be time to rethink it. And the second piece is, 
that Jesus is able to very simply, very calmly, engage in conversation with people who didn't like him very much, who didn't think very highly of him, uh, wanted him out of the way. These are the powers that be, right? They are the authority. They are, they're in control. They're the power. And Jesus is saying to them, you need to th rethink the way that you understand the world. The world is bigger. God is bigger than the box that you have put God in. God doesn't care about your status. God cares about you as a person and them. And we need to be rethinking and reimagining where we are being led as followers. And that is at the, what the core of what we're supposed to be up to as a church, at least in terms of how we think through things and why we do what we do. And so this week, as you're thinking about your own experience with church, what Northmont should be up to, what you're pledging, who you have been, who you hope to be, part of what we're about is making sure that as we make those decisions, as we can reconsider, consider anew where we might be and what we might do, we have to be able to consider the foundational stuff because otherwise, otherwise we're off track. I would be remiss if at some point along the way, I wasn't looking out into the world and kind of looking at what's happening around us as an example. And it's difficult for us to look at what's happening in Israel, Gaza, and Palestine and, and not be not only heartbroken, but be overwhelmed. I think it's overwhelming um, because it forces you to figure out who to listen to and why you listen to them because um, sometimes it can get very political and sometimes it can get very divisive and sometimes it feels like well if it's it's this or this but like I said on Sunday um, we shouldn't be allergic to nuance and we we have to pay attention to um, we have to have a 360 way of looking at and understanding what's in front of us. And if we're led by those commandments, love God, love neighbor, is this thought, is this action, is this decision helping me to do that? When would other people see that? I can see how that decision, how you were caring for your faith how you were caring for your neighbor I can see how that was true then we're always going to at some point disagree or think something a little bit differently than than you know you might think about this situation differently than me or have a different perspective or an understanding of history or whatever but we have to be guided by those things Otherwise, I think we get a little bit lost in just listening to the loudest voice or the most traditional voice or the most radical voice or whatever, instead of being guided by compassion and empathy. And that's my encouragement. And that's at the, the base of our theology. And if we, if we get away from that, then we've gotten away, I think, from what is at our core so that's a lot of what we'll be talking about this week as always I don't know exactly where the sermon is going to go because I don't know where the week's going to take me but uh, 
I like this time of year because I always like thinking about reimagining and looking at again who we can be together. I'm looking forward to working with the session um, and taking a look at the things that you wrote from the town hall meeting. And um, I'm looking forward to us doing some reimagining about uh, where the church is going. So I thank you ahead of time for being those people who do that. I thank you for looking at this text. I thank you for being you. It's pretty great to be doing this with you. So I hope you have a wonderful day. I hope you can get outside if you can, or at least look outside, at least look at the leaves or something. And uh, I'll see you next time for another first look. So until then, take care.